Today I'm going to show you what's inside of your car's electrical system and how it works on your car. Now the electrical system is responsible for controlling and distributing power to all the electrical systems in your car. Now in order to decipher why a car's electrical system is seemingly so complicated, we're going to be breaking it down into six major components, starting with power distribution, then wiring harness, connectors, electrical modules and loads, the wiring diagram, and finally, the CAN bus network. Now that electricity will start its circuit at the front here from the battery where it's stored. Now those circuits are gonna be completed by electricity flowing from the positive side to the negative side of the battery. Now once the vehicle is started, this alternator will take over electrical duty to keep all the electronics in the car running and keep the batteries charged topped off. The electricity then flows to the power distribution unit and then through a wiring harness to each individual component to get power. But enough of that, let's go take a look at a real car's wiring system to see how it's set up. I've got the entire wiring harness for both the body and engine and all the computers out of the car so we're going to take a close look at each of these components and how they work. Now the purpose of these intelligent power distribution units is to take power that's coming from the positive battery terminal through these thick wires over here and then distribute them through first fusible links and then distribute them further into smaller circuits through these fuses over here and then into the relays that follow them for individual circuit functions such as your fog lights or your turn signals and then send those through these much thinner wires to the individual components that require them such as your radio or your ECU. Oh yeah and before you ask, yes that is a Supra. Now each of these fuses are individually removable. That's in case something happens with that circuit. It's only gonna pop the fuse and not pop like the whole battery and cause a fire or something. You've got these larger fusible links. Now these are more susceptible to blowing if you've got a major electrical problem, like you jump your car backwards or your ECU fries everything or something. Now some of these could be automatic circuit breakers where if they warm up too much with heat, they would break the circuit and then when they cool down again, they allow current to flow. Now what it really does is it separates a smaller amperage circuit from a larger amperage circuit. So for example, if you want your ECU, which communicates in milliamps to control something, it's gonna apply 12 volts here in a very small amperage signal. And that's going to bridge the gap between these two here and say, turn the starter on your car or light up a light bulb. In that way, you separate these two circuits physically because there's an electromagnet inside of here. You've also got this diagram on the front here that tells you what type of relay this is. Now, if I remove this cover, you can see we've got an electromagnet inside of here that gets powered up by your ECU signal, and that's gonna suck this part in here, which is gonna allow these contacts to connect to each other. You can see how they're physically separated circuits, and then those contacts will allow your light bulb to turn on. It's gonna open this up so we can have a closer look inside. Now, this whole terminal itself can sometimes be replaced, or some of these contacts inside of here can be replaced if they do get burnt out. Meanwhile, we can tear into the rest of this power distribution module here. Here you can see we have these thick wires here, which goes up to this big fusible link. Essentially, the thicker the wire, the more current it's gonna carry. You can also see that the two 15 amp fuses carry slightly thicker wires on this side compared to the two 10 amp fuses that carry thinner wires. Taking a further look in there, you can see that there is a little rail that runs along the inside here from this positive lead, and that's what powers these smaller fuses over here to this one common positive. Now taking a look at this intelligent power distribution module, we have these two really thick wires here that bring in your current feed. We've got this other set of wires that are slightly thinner than those and then we've got the really small wires like these ones here. Now relays do come in all shapes and sizes just like fuses. You can see these larger ones here are meant for higher current applications such as your horns or your lights whereas these smaller ones here might be for like your instrument cluster or something. Well you can see that this connector here is quite corroded with that green stuff. Now this part does sit outside so corrosion in the terminals is very possible and that could be the cause of one of your electrical issues. And with that cover removed you can see we've got this printed circuit board on the back here that has the solder attachment points for the items that are on top so for example you see RLY3 means relay 3 which is connected over here and JP9 means jumper 9 which means that these two are just shorted together over here each manufacturer is going to have its own nomenclature for each thing but in general this basically links these two all together I'm just going to unscrew this PCB so we can have a closer look at what's inside I'm remove all these relays and one thing I don't like about Nissan is you always need to push on that tab with a screwdriver in order to pull this connector out with Toyotas, you could just do it with your finger. Probably a good idea to save all those fuses. So now with all the fuses and relays removed, I can move this back from this plastic piece here. And you can see what we've got. Now remember this distribution module only shares the positive side of energy that's coming in. It, the negative side is just grounded to the vehicle's body. So this entire rail here is charged with positive energy coming in from the battery. 
we have these individual terminals here where all the relays and fuses plug into. Now these individual connectors are then soldered to the PCB and are then controlled through CAN bus which we're going to talk about later. Now as a comparison here's the power distribution box from a Toyota Corolla. This one's been sitting a while but you can see it's the same idea where we have the fusible links, we have some larger and smaller relays and then a bunch of fuses. We've also got these smaller relay and fuse boxes further down the harness. You can see this one gets its power from the alternator and then feeds the heater, air conditioner and the daytime running lights all of which are very high amperage circuit. Now for the majority of power distribution the negative side of the battery terminal is routed directly to the car's body that way you don't have to run a positive and negative wire to every single component in the car. Now that negative side is appropriately called ground and it also reduces the chances of having a positive to negative short out inside of these high current power distribution modules. So now that we know how power is distributed, we next need to know how power is transmitted throughout the car to each individual component. Now that's done through the wiring harness. Now as mentioned before, when you got a bunch of wires together, it's called a harness. And there are multiple harnesses in a vehicle. The wiring diagram can tell you the exact location of each sub-harness. Now it can also tell you the location of some of the control units inside the vehicle. For example, your engine control module, your navigation unit, your airbag unit, or your driver's seat module. So here I've got a wiring harness out of the vehicle, split at this part here where this part here has this grommet where it goes inside the vehicle. We've got various plugs here that plug into the electronic components and computers that sit underneath the dashboard on this side. And this half here routes outside the vehicle to control its body functions such as lights and horn. Now the wiring harness is basically a bunch of wires that carry either a voltage or a signal to an electronic device such as this body control computer over here. It's typically wrapped up in this conduit and it runs along the body of the car. Now some of these are also wrapped in electrical tape to help with insulation. This is actually one of those GPS vehicle trackers installed on one of those lease vehicles. Now one of the weak points of your electrical system is definitely the harness itself. You can see this is the part here that routes through the engine bay. And you can see just how brittle it is because of all the heat cycling from the engine itself. It's probably pretty easy for one of these to just break off from being just brittle. And then it's going to be pretty difficult to diagnose, especially when this piece is probably under the hood or under the cowl or inside of a fender hidden somewhere. Now since the color of the wires don't change, typically as you go through the harness, you can use this to your advantage when diagnosing. So for example, if I go further down this harness here to where the turn signal plugs in, I have a yellow wire with a green stripe and a white wire with a the green stripe that controls this. So if the signal wasn't working and I figured out it was a wiring issue, I can come further up the harness and I find these white wire and green wires with green stripes respectively and I can pull these wires for voltages to see if anything is coming out of the ECU. If it's not that issue, then it could be a wiring issue between here and here from which I can do a continuity test to find out. Now if the ECU is still outputting voltage but I'm not getting it at my turn signal, I can use these wire colors to check continuity between here and here to see if there's a break in my harness. Now the last part of the wiring harness is proper repair. If you've got a break in the harness, you need to repair that properly. Now to fix something like this, because it's a fixed length, you can't just patch these together. You actually have to cut off a section and solder in a patch wire. And to do that, I'm going to cut off this section here. Then I'm going to strip a length of this wire here and then strip a length of this wire over here. So next I'm going to take an appropriately sized and stripped wire and put some heat shrink on it and I'll tie that in. I'm going to add solder to this side and once the solder is cooled, I'm just going to twist the wire in this way and feed the heat shrink around the soldered connection. And then I'm going to use a heat gun to activate the heat shrink. And that's pretty much how you repair a solder joint. You might want to wrap this up with electrical tape to protect it. Of course, if you're doing multiple wires, you're going to want to stagger your solder joints just so that you don't have a big clump of solder joints in one spot. Now, the same kind of technique is going to be used if you want to splice into your electrical system on your car. For example, you want to add a backup camera. You just need to make sure you have a nice watertight connection. Now at the end of every harness there is a connector and this connector is responsible for conducting electricity through these little terminals over here to the counterpart that plugs in here such as a computer or a motor or a light bulb or something. Now this one does not have any weatherproofing on it because it sits underneath the dashboard but if I get one from underneath the hood you can see that there's this red rubber that goes around there and these small little rubber grommets on the back here to prevent water intrusion. Another common problematic area are the terminals themselves. You can either have a loose connection or green corrosion building up on these terminals which are more common for terminals outside the vehicle and that would cause an open circuit and that part to not function. Now let's say you wanted to deep in one of these connectors to either clean it up or to rewire some of the positions of these because you've swapped ECUs and the wiring is a little bit different. Now in order to deep in you need to understand each connector's retention mechanism. And I'm just going to use this pointed tab here and put it into this top left connector and I'm going to put it in between the plastic tab that's sticking down and the connector blade itself. 
then at the same time I'm applying pressure to the wire behind it and then I can pull it out. Now you can see that the little white plastic tab is what locks into this little valley inside of here and that's what's going to prevent it from being pulled out. So what you're doing is essentially inserting your tool in between this blade here and picking it up away from this valley here and then you can pull this up. Now let's say for example I was rewiring this connection and I wanted to put it into the next slot so I just have to make sure it's oriented correctly and it clicks right in. Now connectors do come in all shapes, sizes and wire counts. You can see this one here is just a single wire that goes into a single connector and it's likely ground or power. Now the most common kinds of connectors have these little tabs here that you have to push down in order to unlock this little tab here and then pull it out of its connectors. Some things have unique connectors such as this body control module here that has this little latch that you got to lift up and then you can pull off its connection. This gives you a more secure connection to vital items like your body control unit. Now another unique connector is the slide mechanism which they use on airbags. Now airbag systems typically use yellow connectors to go to either the seat belts, the airbags themselves or the computer and that gives you quick identification that this is a safety related connector. So here I've got the side impact sensor and you can see the sliding mechanism that I have to pull apart and push it to get this back on. So as an example of connectors I'm going to be taking the seat position control ECU which plugs into this connector over here. Now at the top of the wiring diagram it's labeled S14A and S15B so I can know which one of these correlate to which one of these on the connection. So if I look at the wires that come from the control switch as it plugs into the ECU each one of these has a number with a B next to it which means that it correlates to S15. Now if I go to my pinout diagram over here this is connector S15 which is exactly this connector here and it's labeled from 1 to 22 exactly which pin correlates to which wire on this diagram in addition to the color of the wire. So take for example this wire labeled YG which is a yellow wire with a green stripe as it plugs into the control ECU at 14B. So then I'm going to go to my pinout diagram which is connector B and then I'm going to go to pin 14 which is the sixth one from the left. So if I count six over I'm going to get this pin over here and that correlates to this yellow wire with a green stripe. So as you can see this makes it much easier when doing diagnostics to find the exact wire. Now sometimes seemingly a random amount of electrical components stop functioning and that could be due to a common ground that's either got corrosion on it or it's not contacting the body anymore. And the majority of the wires going here are black colored. Now we're going to take a look at some of the electrical loads that the wiring harnesses plug into. Now here I've got a bunch of computers that control various things. Each car can have dozens of computers actually. For example, this is the body control module and this is the engine control module. This one here controls the immobilizer. We've got the amplifier here for the stereo system. We have the airbag module to control the SRS system. We've got an instrument cluster and also any external lights. These are all examples of things that are linked together in the electrical system to make your car work. Now each one of these modules have their ways of communicating through each other through the CAN bus. We're first going to open this up to take a look at what's inside. This is the black box of magic. It's the immobilizer module that stores all your key codes. Now it's really important inside of a circuit board to understand how things work in order to diagnose it properly. Now one thing that really helps is most of the data sheets are available if you just google the part numbers that are on top of these components. So for example I found out that these are actually relays and this is a power distribution module. This chip over here I have googled it and I found the data sheet. You can see it's right here. It gives me the block diagram of how it works and also the pinout so I know which pins are ground, input and output. Now I'm going to open up this ECU to see what's inside. They actually use thread lock on these screws. And I'll just pry off this cover here. And we've actually double sided taped this ECU to this housing here. Now inside this ECU we have this big chip which is the brains of the computer. We've also got these smaller sub chips here that are like drivers for your fuel injector. And then smaller components such as capacitors and transistors over here. And as a comparison here's a look inside of the Toyota Corolla ECU. At least it's not held in by double sided tape. And you can see this one here has two main brains with a bunch of stand up components such as these transistors over here. Now both boards are double sided and they're coated with this shiny like material to help prevent accidental short circuits and to protect the board from any moisture or degradation. Next we're going to take a look at the airbag computer. Ooh, we can see we have two giant capacitors. Presumably these capacitors store enough energy to fire off an airbag. We've got some kind of a relay here and two little computers inside of here. Now one of these are also an EEPROM that store crash data for law enforcement to investigate collisions. I have no reason why they're going to use Phillips on the ECU and they're going to use Torx on an amplifier. I'll just remove that plate and we have the amplifier unit inside of here. Now the reason why it's got this big hunk of aluminum is because it acts as a heat sink to dissipate a lot of heat that's generated by the transistors and these little modules over here. We've got a 
transformer over here and three giant capacitors and this basically is going to take a lot of current to amplify the radio signal to push it out to the speaker. Now sometimes the solder joints on these amplifiers could crack causing an intermittent sound issue. Now you could reflow those by using a heat gun to warm it up and melt it or you could put this in the oven and bake it. Now the last main component is the most simple and that's just your light bulbs. Because they're situated outside the vehicle it can cause the most problems, especially when you have corrosion in these terminals. And what you can do is get a little bit of electrical contact cleaner, spray it in there, then come in with my brother's old toothbrush and clean that out and make sure that there's no green corrosion or crusty bits left between the interface of the bulb. Next up we're going to be looking at the electrical wiring diagram because it's essential for understanding how car electronics work. Now power is going to start its way at the top and flow towards the bottom. The top here being the positive battery terminal and the power distribution system and the bottom being the ground or the body of the car which flows back to the negative side of the battery. So in this case for the power window systems on my Camry, power is going to flow through a couple of fuses, a fusible link and a relay and that will feed the entire system. Now these lines drawn in here are actual wires and they're colors represent the actual colors of the wire. So for example, this is a black wire with a red stripe and that would look something like this, a black wire with a red stripe on it. The power is then going to make its way down to individual components. In this case, there are modules. The power master switch is one long module over here. We have the power window motor over here and the other three motors over here in the system all represented in these blue boxes. But further down inside these modules we have loads such as lights or in this case motors that move the window up and down. So if we start at the top here power is going to be fed to the power master switch through this line over here and this purple line over here. It's then going to individually feed each motor so that's how the driver is able to control each window. In order to wind the window up or down the power master switch is going to have to supply power to one side and ground to the other side and vice versa if you want to reverse it. However, if you want individual control of let's say this motor, this violet wire is going to provide power here to the switch which is then going to complete a circuit to ground through the master switch over here and then turn the motor in the appropriate direction. Finally, you can see that the circuit is then going to be completed by a main ground through the master window switch. Now in between these wires we have little connections and that's where the body wiring harness would plug into the door wiring harness for example. We've also got junctions where wires come together. Now this is key in understanding when you need to diagnose something. So for example, if something's burned out at the top here, we can use this to measure voltages between here to determine where the break in the wiring is to help us with our diagnostic. So let's say as an example, the rear white window is not working when I press the button. Now before completely ruling out the motor itself, we'll do a little bit of electrical diagnostics using a simple multimeter and the wiring diagram. Now the first thing I want to know is if power is actually getting fed to this door from the body of the car. So I'm just going to remove the switch here and check the voltages at this connection. Now if I disconnect my switch, I can rule that out of the equation and measure the voltages coming from the body harness through here. Now according to this wiring diagram, the purple wire is the one that brings in power when the ignition is on. So I'm going to test that, which is pin Pin 4 on this connector P7. So this is my connector P7 and if I move over to the fourth one, 1, 2, 3, 4, you'll see that I have that purple wire. I'm going to connect my multimeter to that purple wire and a ground point. In this case I'm going to use this screw. So now with the ignition on I'm going to pull pin 4 and touch this against ground and you'll see that I'm getting 12 volt reading here which means I know this door is getting power. Now the next thing to check is if this motor can be grounded and in this case it grounds through the power master switch through this green and red red wire, pin 5 and pin 2. So then next I would pull pin 2 over here which is this red wire and you can see that there's no change in voltage which means that this is not getting ground. Then I'm going to pull pin 5 here which is the green wire and I get 0 volts. So now I know that there's a grounding issue between this door here and the one on the power master switch on the driver's door. Now going back to my wiring diagram I can see that the purple connector and these two wires here both connect at connector BA1. And if I look up BA1 it's the connector between the door and the floor wire in the center pillar. And here's where that connection is between the door and the body. It just plugs into the body harness over here. So the next step would be to check the continuity between this wires here and this wire over here because this wire always flexes when you open the door and could cause a breakage in here. And once again using the wiring diagram I can check the continuity of the same colors and in this case everything is okay. Now if I fast track this a little bit I can see the connections also go through the front kick panel as well as the driver's side kick panel before going to the driver's door. So I'm just going to jump straight to the driver's door and check the connections. And I'll just pull off on this panel here. And we're going to be checking connections over here. Now if we're looking at the left side motor, we should be looking for a green wire with a yellow stripe and a red wire with a yellow stripe which correlate to pins 12 and pins 13. So we're going to look for that over here 
And in this case, you can see we've got the green wire with the yellow stripe, and right beside it, we have the red wire with the yellow stripe. So we're gonna have to back pull these two because you still need this thing connected in order for your power windows to work. Now I'm gonna be doing a continuity check for ground, so I'm gonna shove this in on this side here and touch this over here. And you can see that it's not working. And I'll just move this over to the other side. You can see that it's not working. So we've got an issue inside of here. We've narrowed it down. Luckily in my case, it's just this lockout button that was pressed down that'll lock out the other three windows. And with that button reconnected, I can go ahead and verify my measurements that I have 12 volts on both of those wires. And of course, the switch itself actually works. Now if you look at your typical automotive wiring harness, there really isn't that many wires in here compared to how many modules, switches, and lights, and functions that you have in your car. And the reason for that is because all of these individual modules communicate through a network called the CAN bus. Now one way we can simplify a car electronic system is through a network. So for example, if we were to assign a module to each subsystem, just like this one here for the immobilizer unit, then we can attach all of those to a network where we have two wires, CAN high and CAN low, and each one of those modules can talk through those two wires only. This not only simplifies wiring, but also allows for easier communication between two unrelated modules. Take for example the driver door on my Lexus. How many electronic components have to come off the door and go into the body of the car? We've got the power door lock at the top here. We've got a light behind this handle. We have all the power window switches and the door lock switches, as well as the memory seat switches at the front here. We have a puddle light at the bottom there, as well as the power door lock mechanism. Now this is not to mention we have a touch sensor here, a door lock switch here, a key detection switch here, the power window itself, a power mirror with heat and a light underneath. Now if we were to wire these components individually, the harness between the body and the door here would be absolutely huge and unattainable. And that's where a small little module like this one would centralize all the electronics in this door and then send it through a network into the body of the vehicle to be processed. And now we come to the discussion on CAN bus. Now CAN bus is basically a widely adopted standard across all automotive electrical systems. It uses the aforementioned CAN high and CAN low signals to form data. So for example, when CAN high is high and CAN low is low, these are differential signals, so they're always going to be opposite. It's going to give you a zero bit, and vice versa, when they're both at the recessive voltage, the data reads one. Now this is a binary data. If we combine this together, we can get a full frame of data. So think of these like letters, and this is basically a word within the CAN bus frame. Now that word, or CAN bus frame, is what electronic modules use to communicate with each other across the CAN bus. Now your most important bits are going to be your starter frame and your end of frame. We have the actual data that's transmitted in the middle here, and then we have the address, which will address the exact module that you want to talk to. And now you can see how two otherwise unrelated modules can talk to each other over the CAN bus. So for example, this is the immobilizer module here, and it will talk to the seat control module when you insert key number two to set your driving position to driver number two. Without the CAN bus, you can imagine just how many wires would have to link these two together just to get that function. Now the real reason why CAN bus was widely adopted was to comply with the OBD2 protocol to help with onboard diagnostics for emissions and engine trouble codes. So for example, any code that comes up on your reader that begins with a P here is a standardized code that's going to be the same across all vehicles. So for example, if you have a cylinder two misfire, P0302, that's going to be the same across all makes and all models of vehicles. Similarly for P0101, it means that the system is too lean. And you can see there's going to be a complete dictionary and an alphabet for all of the possible P codes that you can look up online. However, there are still some codes that are proprietary to that automotive manufacturer, like this SRS code, and you're going to need a software such as Toyota's TechStream or Volkswagen's VAGCOM software in order to read it because it uses its own version of CAN bus. Now, another benefit to having all the modules linked on the CAN bus system is that I can easily access it when I'm doing diagnostic. Here I've got my Lexus GS350 hooked up, and you can see just how many of the individual computers in this car I can access with Toyota's TechStream software. Now the only computer that you can pretty much access with any OBD2 reader is the engine computer because that's been standardized over the OBD2 protocol. The rest of these are all pretty much proprietary to Lexus and Toyota. Now the great thing of having all of these computers accessible is that I can do a good amount of customization within the software. I can play with my wireless door locks, my security system, light controls, sliding roof, and so many other functions all within the software without actually getting physically down into the hardware level. Now the most important part of this software is really for diagnostic. And if we take the 
example of my power window that wasn't working, I have access to the passenger side door module inside of here where I can actually wind up and down the motor from inside the software itself. That could rule out things like a bad switch or a bad computer if it works through here but it doesn't work at the door and I don't have to open up any door panels or measure voltages. And here you're going to see I'm going to wind up the window just using the laptop itself. As I press the button here, you see that the window winds up and I can stop it and then I can continue it all the way. Ah, it squished my laptop wire. You can also do cooler things like fold out the passenger side mirror. But there are many different other modules and different tabs here that I can access to test to see if they're actually being read by the ECUs. For example, if I turn on my wipers here, you can see that that's actually switched to the on position there for the wipers. I can also get into more advanced diagnostics like graphing the oxygen sensors if you have an issue with the catalytic converter. So the next time your car actually decides to start up and run, think of all these components that have to work behind the scenes under your dashboard to make it work. Make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe and hit the bell notification icon if you want to see more videos just like this one.